In your everyday life, you may not be aware that inflation was really low, almost negative for many years, and recently has ticked up quite a bit. How should investors handle this? I'm Jack Otter, editor of Barron's.com. I'm here with Kitesh Bardwaj, who is the head of research for Summerhaven Asset Management. Uh, can you, first of all, just give us the, the quick rundown of what inflation had been doing maybe since the Great Recession and how you saw a turn about a year ago? Inflation, if, if you go back five years, uh, year over year inflation peaked around 2011. It was around 4%. And uh, then different macro events started happening. There was a lot of uh, Greek crisis. Um, and what happened was over the last five years, from 11 to 2015, year over year inflation steadily declined from 4% to around 2015 to actually negative for a brief period. And uh, so uh, with that, uh, the, what has happened recently inflation has started going up. That's year over year change. It's not, of course, investors and uh, common people are not seeing it uh, because it's still low, uh, but, but it has gone from negative to right now, year over year inflation is around 2%. And that's a fairly rapid jump, right? Yes, in one year it has gone from uh, uh, negative to uh, 2%. And uh, you see it also in the break even inflation, which is the inflation that is priced in, in the tips market. That's Treasury infl Inflation Protected Securities. Yes, that's Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. If you, you can compare the tips, five-year tips and five-year nominal bonds. This is billions of dollars of market. This is what investors are pricing in inflation going forward. If you look at those market, five-year inflation bottomed out in February 2016. It was down to 1%. So in, in February 2016, market, was, market participants were pricing in a 1% annualized inflation for next five years. That has rapidly gone from 1% uh, to almost 2%. So right now we are in a regime where year over in, year inflation is 2% and market expectations of forward looking inflation is around 2% as well. We're hearing uh, from overseas that some of the zero interest rate policies may not be continuing. Here in the U.S., we're expecting um, expansionary fiscal policy from the new Trump administration. Are there other forces that are also possibly pushing inflation higher? Inflation, of course, uh, uh, positive uh, fiscal response from the Trump administration and the fact that uh, things might finally get done in Washington because one party controls all three, uh, both the houses and uh, the White House. Uh, so it, it is still to be seen what they will get accomplished, but what market is pricing in is uh, that uh, there will be a f uh, expansionary fiscal policy coming out of the new administration. That's what uh, President, uh, President elect then and President has been, had been promising. But the uptick in the inflation started way before that. Uptick in the inflation, really, inflation expectation started, as I said, in February 16. So th there, there were market uh, forces that were operating uh, before uh, Trump, and, uh, Trump was elected. And uh, those forces had to do with the fact that we saw five years of declining inflation, declining commodity prices, and there were supply-side responses to that. Uh, you know, some of the commodities, copper, uh, industrial metals, corn, saw 50 to 60 percent decline in prices. Wow. So the producers don't have that kind of margin. So producers were hurting. And uh, first response to the producer is to take the pain for some time. And then eventually the weaker uh, uh, producers, they start closing shop. So we, we saw inflation started ticking up. Inflationary expectations started ticking up before uh, because the election. supply was constrained. Before supply was constrained. And uh, uh, there were less uh, inventories were starting to get pressure from uh, supply uh, constraint. But the election uh, actually gave a, a, a stimulus, if you say. Um, after the election, inflationary expectation really shot up. Now, you, there are many asset classes that correlate in one way or another to inflation, but you say one of the closest correlations is commodity futures. Uh, and, and investors can get access to commodity futures via a fund? There are a lot of liquid assets that provide you inflation uh, correlation or inflation hedge. You know, you can buy REITs, you can buy commodity equities, 
or you can buy commodity futures. Uh, REITs and commodity equities have equity and bond component. If you want to get exposure to inflation, inflationary beta, uh, as an investor, commodity futures are the most direct way. Why do I say that? Uh, so commodity futures, uh, you're not buying oil if you're buying a commodity future. You're not buying a barrel of oil and storing it and hoping the price will go up. You basically buy uh, oil for delivery in future. So you, you get return when the future price end up being higher than the future price today. If the future price end up being lower, you, you basically get a loss. So you, you get positive returns if there is higher inflation, higher than what the market price then. So any inflationary shock directly gets priced in in terms of returns uh, that you get from uh, commodity futures. So commodity futures tend to be uh, a direct way to get exposure to upside, upswing in commodity prices. And uh, to the second part of your question, you can always invest in one commodity, but it becomes a very risky proposition. You, you've got to be not only have a great deal of skill, but an extraordinary amount of luck, right? Yes, absolutely. You, you need to be a stock picker on steroids to get, uh, because there are as very few commodities, to get one commodity right. Because you know, if, if you could predict that OPEC was going to cut prices, it was the best. Uh, OPEC was uh, going to cut output. It was the best deal in town. But because it becomes very, uh, it's, it's, it's a lottery ticket. So the approach that we take, the approach that we like, is you invest in commodities that are in relatively low inventory state, so relatively low physical stock. And the reason for that is if you have low physical stock between commodity A and commodity B, there's a lot of physical stock. If there's a positive demand shock, if suddenly a demand comes uh, around the corner, the commodity with a lower physical stock will have a much violent swing up. If you have a lot of physical stock, the stock can take care of that. So you can supply something uh, quickly, uh, to satisfy the demand. So uh, the view is you have a broad basket of commodities, and you try to pick commodities that are in relatively low inventory state. And while, of course, it's tempting to go for that single, the lean hogs or the zinc or whatever you think is going to do great, over the long term, you've said they do tend to balance out. Sure, you have winners over a three-year period, say, but if you own a basket, that basket of commodities for 30 years, they tend to all kind of rise together in concert with inflation? Yes. So the basic factor that drives uh, the commodity returns is twofold. One is uh, GDP growth. If you have extraordinary GDP growth, it takes all the commodities with it. If you have uh, unexpected inflationary shocks, positive or ne negative, it, that, that, that factor drives positive or negative returns for commodities. So over a long period of time, uh, all the sectors co-move with these two underlying factors. And yes, you are right. If you could pick, if your market time was sector, uh, you would do very well. In, in the early part of 2000s, the best sector was industrial metals because of the China story. Industrial metals uh, really did very well. If you go back before that, in the late part of the 90s, energy did very well. And uh, last three years, the best performing sector is livestock. So every sector uh, gets its turn. Uh, however, the basic factors are reflected in all the uh, sectors. So a broadly diversified commodity basket uh, reduces your risk because you diversify across these sectors and gets you exposure to the underlying inflation factor. And right now that underlying inflation factor looks going higher. Uh, that's what it seems like, yes. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jack.